Well, hello, I'm Jerry Dearman. Welcome to today's word where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every day. And by the way, please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to invite others to read with us because reading God's word every day will change your life. Well, let's pray and jump into the word. Father, thank you for your holy written, inspired, living, active word. We pray that as we read these words today, that by the Holy Spirit, you will customize and personalize these words to each of us so that each of us will hear what we need to hear from you. And we pray it in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Luke chapter nine. And here's what it says. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Notice he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Well, you know, we have that same power and authority now by the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Most believers don't use that power and authority. But we ought to, because there are many people who are demonized. In fact, sometimes, I, not, I will clear not to say always, but sometimes a person dealing with mental illness is really dealing with demonic spirits. That's not always the case, but that is sometimes the case. And sometimes we're trying to treat somebody that is demonized with medical treatment, psychological treatment. You cannot use psychology to drive out a demon. That's not going to work. And so if you just take demonized people to the medical professionals or a psychologist that doesn't, it isn't a believer and doesn't know how to discern whether this is a spirit or not and know what to do about this evil spirit, well then, <laughs> I mean, you may have certain behavior that seems to be corrected, but without exercising those demons, meaning uh, without driving those demons out as Jesus did and as his disciples did, then we leave the person in the same state that they were in. But notice Jesus gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He sent them to preach and to heal. See, not just preach, but to preach and to heal. And it goes on to say in verse 3, And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Isn't this interesting that the first time Jesus sent out his disciples, he said, don't take any extra supplies. Now, later on, we'll see that he asked them, when I sent you out before, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. And then he said, well, this time, go ahead and take some extra supplies, take some extra money, take an extra staff, and so on, whatever you'd like to take. But it was evident that Jesus was teaching them here that God will provide for you when you serve him, when you are in the ministry. He wanted to let them know not to depend on themselves, even preparation. That doesn't mean we shouldn't prepare. But in this particular case, Jesus was teaching his disciples that God would look over them, would provide for them as they serve God in the ministry and are obedient. Okay, verse 4, he goes on to say to them, Whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. You're coming in my name, Jesus is saying, and preaching God's kingdom and that God has sent a Savior to this world and they won't listen to God's message even though in their heart they have a sense that it's true. He said, shake off the dust from your, from your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, that city, the, the, the place where the people are who will not receive God's love, God's salvation, God's message. He said, their dust is not even worthy to stay on your shoes. And so shake it off as a testimony against them. So, verse 6, after Jesus had said these things, it says, So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Notice, these are disciples of Jesus before they were born again. Jesus had not died on the cross. He had not yet been raised from the dead. Nobody could be born again. And yet he delegated power and authority to them. And they're not only preaching, but they're healing. The healing power of God is coming 
from them, laying hands on people and maybe speaking words of healing, and people are being healed by the power of God before they were born again. Well, if these men can do it before they were born again, certainly we can do it after we've been born again and we've got the Holy Spirit in us, and especially if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We certainly ought to be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, as Jesus said in Mark 16, 18. Verse 7, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, talking about John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, whom Herod had beheaded. And so it goes on to say, uh, some people were saying that Jesus, because of the miracles, was John risen from the dead. And by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. So you can see uh, some of the theories that people were speculating about and spreading rumors about trying to explain the power on Jesus' life and who he must be uh, if this is happening. Verse 9, Herod said, John I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him, told Jesus, all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew, excuse me, but when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. So the twelve disciples are coming and saying, Lord, you got thousands of people here. Send them away because they're hungry and they need something to eat. They need to find a place to stay the night because they've come out to your service, you know, to your ministry to hear you teach. But they've been with us several days. Send them away to get lodging and to get food. Verse 13. But he, Jesus, said to them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> now they're looking at thousands of people. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. So this is not counting the children or the spouses, the women, just 5,000 men. So we would presume this has to be uh, a crowd of 15,000 strong or more. So it goes on to say, Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. Interesting. Make them sit down in groups of 50. What is he doing? He is preparing for a miracle. I think this is where we go wrong sometimes. We pray for miracles. We pray for God to answer prayer. But we don't make the preparations because you're not going to make preparations. You're not going to tell the people to sit down in an organized way as if you're going to pass out food if you don't believe there's going to be any food. But Jesus believes that there is going to be food for everybody. So he's having them to organize everybody to have them sit down in groups of 50. And another gospel said groups of 50s and hundreds. And they're preparing in faith for a miracle. And Jesus is the one here that has the faith. Verse, verse 15. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and watch this, and looking up to heaven. What does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus is depending on the power of God. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate, all 5,000 men plus the women, the children. So they all ate and were filled. This was an all-you-can-eat meal. They were filled, and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. 12 baskets. Isn't that interesting? 12 disciples and 12 baskets. See, when you serve the Lord and are obedient to Him, Walk in faith, follow his direction. There'll not only be enough for the people you're ministering to, but there'll be enough for you. Praise God. Okay, verse 18. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and asked, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. So notice, uh, these theories again of 
uh, Jesus being somebody from of old, some prophet from before who has risen from the dead. Verse 20, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Uh, Matthew 16 it records it as Peter saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter uh, said, the Christ of God. Christ means Messiah. Literally, it means anointed one. Messiah is the Old Testament word. Christ is the New Testament word. But when you translate those words into English, it's literally the anointed one. So you are the anointed one, talking about the Messiah. You are the anointed one of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, why would Jesus tell them not to tell anybody? Doesn't he want everybody to know that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God? Well, he does want people to know. But notice it says uh, he strictly warned them, warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things. In other words, if if and when people find out, Jewish people, these were Jewish people they were ministering to, find out that he's the Messiah, well, they know the scriptures. The Messiah is actually actually going to bring uh, peace and a government leadership to the Jewish people to save them. And he knew that they wouldn't understand that the Messiah was actually going to come twice. The first time he was going to come, yes, to heal and to preach, but to die to suffer. It's the second coming where he's going to fulfill the other prophecies about setting up the government and wiping out all of the opposing governments on earth. And he will rule for a thousand years in the thousand year millennial reign. See, the Jews would have known those scriptures. So if they hear and believe that he's the Messiah, they're ready to make him the king. They're ready to set up the government. And so notice he strictly commanded and warned them to tell no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things. See, they wouldn't want him to suffer because he's the Messiah. But Jesus knew, no, I need to suffer right now. And uh, they would misunderstand my coming here. So it says, the Son of Man must suffer, he said, many, uh, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. That's the part that's in the Old Testament, it's in the prophecies. For example, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions, He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. They did not understand the Messiah was going to fulfill that prophecy. They thought it must be about somebody else. Verse 23, Then He said to them all, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So Jesus just finished explaining that he's going to die. He's going to be killed. He's going to be crucified, really. And then he says, if anyone wants to come after me, any of you want to follow me, then you're going to have to deny yourself. You can't just live a cushy life and go after, if we could say it in our language today, the American dream, just to you know live on easy street. no. He said, I'm coming here to sacrifice and to give of myself, even my very life, to save people. You want to come after me? You want to be a part of my ministry and my kingdom? You're going to have to deny yourself as well. Take up your cross, and you're going to have to take it up every day. That doesn't mean we're going to be crucified, literally, and certainly not every day. But in other words, every day, your flesh will want to do what you want to do. We'll want to take care of number one, take care of yourself. And he's saying, no, that's not the life we live in the kingdom of God. We have people to reach, and we, we're going to have to sacrifice every day. Verse 24, he goes on to say, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me... And my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory. Notice the second coming, when he comes. Well, he's standing there now. Yeah, he said, when he comes. When he comes. So there's another coming that Jesus is acknowledging. He said, if anyone's ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed 
when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. So notice, there are some standing here. He's talking to his disciples and he said, some of you are not going to taste death until you see, notice, until you see, until they see the kingdom of God. Well, what is that all about? Well, we're going to find out right now. Verse 28. Now it came to pass about eight days later, about eight days later. I think one of the other gospels say is about six days later. Well, six and eight are about the same, aren't they? So the Bible's true. Uh, now it came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Uh, I presume this is Mount Hermon or Hermon because another passage, uh, I think it was Matthew's gospel, 17th chapter says he went up, took them up on an exceedingly high mountain. So he took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. It says here, Peter, John, and James. Usually says Peter, James, and John. This time it says Peter, John, and James. Peter's always first though. He took Peter, John, and James and went up <clears throat> on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah. Interesting. Well, they've been dead. Moses has been dead by that time. Let's see, 1,500 years or so. And Elijah had been dead, well, maybe about 600 years. And so, uh, well, how are these men appearing with him? Well, you can see that his face was altered. His robe became white. What's happening? These men are actually seeing a vision of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah at the end of the age, like in the tribulation period. You remember the two prophets that show up in the book of Revelation? I'm convinced it's Moses and Elijah. And they were talking about the end times. They were having a conversation here about the end times. And so when they're seeing Jesus in his face, his, his clothes were so white, another Gospel says, as no launderer could make the clothes that white. No bleach could make them that white. They were glowing. They were glistening, so to speak. And so uh, they're not seeing Jesus just put on a different outfit. No, they're seeing a vision of the way he will be after he's glorified. And they're also seeing a vision of the way the, the two prophets will look. And I, I believe it, uh, that Moses and Elijah, who show up here, are the two prophets, primarily for this reason. There are others, but primarily for this reason. Number one, because the signs that those two prophets in the book of Revelation will do, it says that they'll bring down plagues. Well, that's what Moses did. That's what he's famous for, you know, in Egypt. Brought down plagues. They could bring down plagues on uh, people in the book of, in the tribulation period. And they could command that it won't rain. And so uh, that's what Elijah did. And just so happens that these two men show up and Jesus said, some of you will not taste death till you see the kingdom of God. In Matthew, uh, he said, until you see the Son of Man in his kingdom, in his glory. And so they're seeing the end of the age. This is like God took the timeline, you know, of here they are when Jesus is here. We know that the end of the age is at least about 2,000 years into the future because we're here and now and Jesus hasn't come back yet. But, it, but it's like God folded the timeline and they intersected. Well, it's, it's a vision that he's showing them. But nonetheless, exactly what he predicted, some of you will not taste death till you see. And here they are seeing Jesus in his glory at the end of the age. And they also get this bonus of seeing these two prophets, Moses and Elijah. So it says... Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory, see, there. this is uh, after the glorification, appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So, behold, let me read verse 30 again. Behold, two men talked with him, talked with him. So Moses and Elijah were conversing with Jesus, uh, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So listen to this. This is interesting. Moses and Elijah are conversing with Jesus about his death. That's about to happen in Jerusalem, but this end of the age conversation 
is happening, at least we know now about 2,000 years after his death, but they're conversing about it then. So it, it's really a bending of the timeline, an intersection of the timeline. Well, God can do that, and he does that. And this is not the only scenario in the Bible that I believe that happened, but I won't get into that now. All right, uh, notice here, verse 32. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory, Jesus' glory, and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him, the two men, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. Do you remember what a tabernacle is back in the wilderness when God had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and uh, toward the promised land? They were in the wilderness. And God so much wanted to be with his people that he told Moses, make a tabernacle, a tent, a special tent. And he told him exactly how to make it and make a special room called the Holy of Holies. And that's where I'm going to dwell and put the tabernacle right in the middle of the camp. I want to live with my people. I want my people to dwell with me. Why would God in heaven want to come down in the hot Middle East desert and live in a tent? One reason, because he loves his people. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to protect them. He wanted to converse with them. He wanted to, to be their God and for them to be his people. And so now that tabernacle is a big thing because God dwelled in the middle of, dwelt in the middle of his people. So here's Peter saying, let's make three tabernacles. You know, he's excited that he saw this vision. Let's make one for you, one for most, and one for Elijah. Well, that wasn't God's will. That's just an idea. A lot of ideas pop into our heads and we don't know what to say and we just say something. But that doesn't mean it, it has any wisdom to it or that it's God. So Peter said, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. So they're up on this high mountain, and a cloud comes on the high mountain. So now, now they're in the cloud on this mountain. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Well, that's Father God, obviously. This is my beloved son. Hear him. In other words, stop talking about what you should do. Stop making recommendations because you don't know what you're talking about. Hear him. Just listen to Jesus and he'll tell you what you need to know. Verse 36. Boy, we got to really pick up the speed here because this is a lengthy chapter. 62 verses. And we're a little over halfway done. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried, say, cried out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him. And he suddenly cries out and convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Now see, this father knew that his son was demonized. And he said, a spirit convulses him. But you know, today we have some people that act like this. They're extreme cases. But you know, secular people, people that don't know about spiritual things, don't understand it, well, they'll just... Uh, diagnose a person like this with some psychological, you know, mental disorder. But it wasn't a mental disorder. It was a spiritual disorder. Verse 41, then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. Why is he saying that? Because in verse 40, the father said, I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. In other words, they tried but they couldn't cast it out. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring your son here. In other words, he didn't say, well, sometimes prayers work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes God answers, sometimes he doesn't. No, that's not how Jesus responded. Jesus said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. In other words, the reason the disciples could not cast out this demon is uh, unbelief. It's unbelief. And when you have something, somebody demonstrative like this, especially if you have people around and there's a seizure and all kinds of things and people are there, boy, you're so self-aware. You're conscious of what people think. And, and when you say come out and the seizure continues or gets worse or whatever, it's hard on your faith. 
But notice Jesus said, bring him here. Bring him here to me, another gospel says. In other words, it is the will of God for him to be delivered. Bring him here to me. And so verse 42, and as he was still coming, the demon threw him down, the, the boy, and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. It was the will of God. Now watch this. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they didn't understand. Now in another gospel, it says the disciples came to him privately and said, Lord, why couldn't we cast him out? And the very first thing Jesus said is, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. And I already explained to you why that would be the case. And then he went on to say, however, these kind do not come out except by prayer and fasting. Uh, well, eating or not eating does not make a demon come out. But if you'll pray and fast and build yourself up in your faith, then even when these demonstrative things happen, you'll be able to stay with your faith and hang on and demand that those demons leave. Verse 45, but they did not understand this saying, talking about the Son of Man being betrayed into the hands of men. They didn't understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus perceived the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him, in, set him by him and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be great. Jesus is really calling them to humble themselves before one another. Verse 49, Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him. We, in other words, we prohibited him. We told him not to do it. We forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, in other words, to go back to heaven. Uh, we were coming to this season because Jesus died, was raised from the dead, and then it was just, uh, uh, oh, about a month later that Jesus ascended to heaven. So when it says, when it came the time for him to ascend back to heaven, to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. As they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was uh, set for the journey to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? The Holy Spirit knew when Jesus was coming to a town or a city to minister or not. And in this case, he was just traveling through these towns. And so the disciples got to this town and, and they noticed that the people weren't receiving Jesus, welcoming him like they normally would. And so... Verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? So <laughs> they're thinking, we need to call fire down and consume these people. But Jesus, he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you were of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to to another village. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, <laughs> this is not going to be a cushy life if you follow me. Verse uh, 59, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, when he says, go bury my father, that doesn't mean that his father is already dead and just needs to be buried. I mean, that's possible. But this was language that would be used when a parent was elderly and they could die, you know, now in the next year, in the next two years or whatever. And so let me, let me go and make sure that my father who is aging gets buried and Jesus said let the dead bury their own dead he's not he's not contradicting the the commandment of God one of the ten commandments honor your father and your mother no he's just saying you're always going to have a reason why you're not going to follow Jesus and 
Often it'll be something you can even look at a scripture and say, well, the Bible says to do this, so I, I can't do what Jesus is saying to do. And Jesus is saying, look, if I, the Son of God, your Lord, am asking you to do something, I've already taken into account what the Bible says. It's his word. And so he's saying, let the dead bury their own dead. In other words, you can't just do what everybody thinks you ought to do. Now, of course, Jesus would have wanted him to be there when his father passed and to bury him and such. But he's teaching a principle here that even family cannot become more than Jesus in our lives. Jesus must be first. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who were at my house. I just want to go say bye to everybody. And Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, you have to be obedient when God says to be obedient. You have to learn just first time obedience, we say about raising children. First time obedience is so good for the children. And it's so good for us as well. Well, that's chapter 9. I look forward to tomorrow. Chapter 10. Thank you for watching today. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of these videos. And if you'd like to start a house church, either with The Rock, a four-square church, or with Solid Lives, our global discipleship and church planning ministry, go to one of those websites. Go to therock.com for The Rock or solidlives.com for Solid Lives. Click on House Churches and fill out the interest form. We'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God.